Hey, good morning, everyone. It's Eileen. And so um, I, Eileen Bird, I'm here with Two Life. And uh, we are going to, you're in the right place for our program on managing breast cancer recurrence with Lily Shockney. And so I'm actually going to start by uh, a couple of different things. And one is that Lily was, um, was on and we had done all of our uh, investigative work, but the area that she's in has had a significant power uh, change and or outage, and she has absolutely no internet uh, connectivity. So she's going to join us by phone. And so uh, with that, I'm going to start a couple things on, um, on getting us set up. We should hear Lily come on and on just a short bit. I was just on the telephone with her. And isn't it wonderful uh, that we have telephones in this world after all said and done? And I, I, I'll add my own aside that my husband uh, was career with, uh, with Verizon and, um, and, and he's the dial tone guy. So he will get a chuckle out of this when he hears all this tonight. Okay, so with that said, uh, here we are with our, actually this is our 11th uh, annual Women's Health Conference. Uh, we have moved the conference to a virtual format both last year and this year. It's hard to believe that we're getting towards the end of 2021. Uh, and and I, as I looked at the uh, list of registrants for today's program, and um, we had about, I think, 98 people that were signed on. And so, and most of the people have signed on for the full series. And so this series of, uh, of talks is going to be addressing uh, the topics related to uh, not only managing uh, breast cancer reoccurrence and, uh, and the concerns around reoccurrence, but we will have a program on nutrition. Uh, we will have another program on psychological trauma and on integrative therapies. And so you will see in the emails that'll come after this, uh, those programs and if you, your you know, situation changes and you hadn't signed up for one of them, if you want to uh, extend the invitation to someone that you know, so please do so. Now it's just a matter of Lily's by the phone, but we are having a couple of issues related to getting her live and into the meeting. And so just as soon as we do that, I ask for just a, a little bit of patience as we get through that particular piece of it. But I also want to mention a couple things. Uh, one is that uh, we've had some staffing changes here at Two Life. Uh, our, uh, our support services program manager, Melanie McCulley, uh, has left the organization. And I'm happy to, uh, to, to announce that Jamila Hills has taken on that role. She's been with us for just a couple of weeks now. And so as she uh, is starting to pick up support groups uh, next week and uh, managing the, uh, the telephones and the outreach, uh, she'll be running workshops. And, uh, and as time goes on, she'll be doing more and more of the educational programming and um, so we're happy to have, have Jamila, and I know she is on uh, part one of the participants on today. So anyway, oh, Jamila, hi, you're gonna say hi. Hello. Good morning. Yes, I was just on the phone um, with a caller who's trying to get access to the link. Um, okay. But yes, good morning, everyone. Um, as Eileen mentioned, my name is Jamila Hills, and I am the new services support program manager here at Two Life. Um, I'm about a month in. And I am just ecstatic to be a part of such a phenomenal organization that does such fantastic work um, for our survivors and for those who are in treatment and their families. And I'm even more honored to be a part of my first annual women's conference series. And I look forward to learning all that I can from Lily and all of the other presenters who will be hosting throughout the upcoming months. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, thanks, Jamil. I'm so glad you're able to, to join on here. And, yeah. uh, and, um, and I just got a tickle in my ear that uh, they're just about uh, through some of the technology issue related to getting Lily uh, live with us. And so I want to tell you a little bit about Lily. And you may have seen uh, some of this already, but Lily is, um, Lily is, is kind of amazing. And we found her as we were uh, really investigating the whole topic of, uh, of managing our, our, um, our, our concerns about the, the topic of reoccurrence. And Lily was the former director of the John Hopkins Breast Center in Baltimore. 
Uh, she is a registered nurse with a Bachelor of Science in Health Administration from St. Joseph's College in New York, a Master of Administrative Science from Johns Hopkins. And she spent a lot of time with Johns Hopkins. Ms. Shockney is a published author and nationally recognized speaker on breast cancer. And Lily has written 15 books She's on and more than 300 articles on the topic of breast cancer. She's also a consultant for breast cancer on a number of, uh, of outlets, including ABC News and Good Morning America, has consulted regular on the Today Show. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, she's an active clinical researcher. In 2008, the John Hopkins Board of Trustees appointed Lily to a physician's chair as a, univer as a university distinguished service assistant professor on breast cancer. And I'm gonna let the rest of that go because I have a tickle in my throat. And I think Lily has joined us now. And so Lily, I'd like to welcome you. Hello. Okay. Um, oh boy. Hello. Okay. Hey, we're, we're good. Let's try it. <laughs> <laughs> Lily, welcome. Okay. Good morning. I hear Thank your you. voice. Thank you. Oh boy. <laughs> and if I hear your voice, then others do as well. All right. <laughs> okay. Lily, you've been introduced and I'm going to let you okay. get right to it. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. And thank you for your patience. Um, as, my, uh, com as my computer has a hissy fit and says there's no internet in my area. Uh, so this morning, I'm going to talk about dealing with fear of uh, recurrence of breast cancer. And to start, we really need to talk about um, what do we mean by recurrence? So there's three types of recurrence. One is local recurrence. And <clears throat> what that means is that it has returned locally in the area where it first started. So in this case for breast cancer, it has recurred in the breast. Even if you've had a mastectomy, that still could mean you could have a local recurrence because there's about 2% of breast tissue that remains after a mastectomy. Um, <clears throat> second is a regional recurrence, which means that it has come back regionally in the area of um, the lymph nodes under the arm or in the chest area, but usually the lymph nodes under the arm. And then finally, distant recurrence, which is where it shows up uh, on a scan. Uh, that would be a PET CT, for example. And uh, what, it, what that means is, is that distance recurrence and metastatic breast cancer, stage four breast cancer are one and the same. In order to confirm that it is distant recurrence, that it is in fact metastatic disease, there must be a biopsy done of the area where this has been identified. So for example, that could be the bone, that could be the lung, that could be the liver, um, or, or even elsewhere. So uh, when, that, when that does occur, we don't uh, refer to it yet as metastatic disease until we know for sure uh, by having gotten a biopsy and gotten those results back. You can have a scan done and they'll see some little ditzel pixel on it and freak you out. I've had that done to me as an almost 30 year breast cancer survivor. And what it ends up, ended up being ironically in my lungs was a grain of Chinese rice that I had aspirated on a few weeks prior to that. But for about two weeks, I thought I had metastatic disease to my lungs. <laughs> that was quite unfun. So ironically, when we say that it has recurred, one of the goofy things about this is that it actually hasn't come back. It was there all along. And that's what makes this a little strange, um, is that there were microscopic cells elsewhere in your body that had traveled from one location, that being the breast, to another organ site and they sat there dormant and they could not be seen on any imaging study. They just sat there quietly until <clears throat> lo and behold, you got an ache or pain or something that caused you to, uh, to end up uh, saying, gee, I think I better see my doctor because I really don't feel very well. <clears throat> so most recurrences happen within the first one to five years. The higher the stage of the breast cancer, the sooner it will recur um, if it's destined to do so. And there are some individuals with very early stage breast cancer, stage one, stage two breast cancer, 
whose cancer was uh, ER positive, uh, estrogen receptor positive, and HER2 negative, that recurrence of metastatic disease could actually happen many years later. And I say many as in 10 years or 15 years uh, later. These are the patients that you see on TV in the commercials for CDK4-6 inhibitors, that particular drug. Their cancer is treated as a chronic illness and they may live two decades or more in harmony with their disease. Those who recur sooner are usually ones that have triple negative disease or have ER negative and HER2 positive disease. Their treatments are primarily with chemotherapy. However, newer drugs are being developed and even vaccines, uh, for example, for triple negative have very recently been developed uh, for the treatment of triple negative that has spread on elsewhere. And there are now quite a few other targeted agents, even beyond those that you see in the commercials. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So recurrence, especially distant recurrence of what we know as metastatic breast cancer, stage four breast cancer, is the greatest concern of most breast cancer survivors. And it doesn't even matter what the stage was originally. I have seen women with stage zero, DCIS, non-invasive breast cancer. I've seen and taken care of women with stage three C, breast cancer, both react the same way. They're both scared to death, though it's the individual with a much higher stage that would run a much greater risk of potentially having a stage four disease. So the message here, however, is this. Enjoy your life that was saved for you and put fear of recurrence in a place that doesn't allow it to rob you of your joy every day. So do you actually know what your risk of recurrence even is? If you don't, you should ask your doctor, tell me what my risk of local recurrence is. Tell me what my risk of distant recurrence is. Uh, tell me about my regional recurrence, but most worry about distant recurrence. I had a patient contact me and told me that she had developed metastatic toe cancer. <clears throat> she was out power walking as a way to exercise to reduce her risk, which was a very good idea, doing that each day. And uh, her cancer had been in her left breast. She thought that brisk walking caused cancer cells to gravitate down into her toe on her left foot. So <clears throat> when she sent me a photo of her toe, it was very clear to me that she had gout. It was interesting, though, how she felt um, that this was very logical, that she would now have what she called toe cancer, <laughs> her metastatic breast cancer to her toe. <clears throat> you can't get toe cancer, by the way. Um, so it's important to understand that metastatic disease is still breast cancer cells that have traveled to another organ site. So it's not bone cancer or lung cancer or liver cancer. It is breast cancer that is spread to other organs. <clears throat> so did you do all the treatments that your doctors advised you to do? That's a really key question. For individuals that said, no, I don't want to do chemo or no, I'm not going to do hormonal therapy or no, I want to do don't want to do targeted therapy or whatever that it was, there can be some guilt ridden with that and greater worry because you're trying to outguess, frankly, if you've jinxed yourself. <clears throat> Again, I tell people, you make decisions for your life based at the time that that decision needs to be made. And we can't go backwards, so don't look that way. We're here today and we're going to move forward. So <clears throat> there are... Uh, I want to give you an, an analogy because, um, first of all, I'm hoping that you are living a healthy lifestyle. I'm going to assume that uh, from the beginning and that that actually does dramatically help to reduce your risk of, uh, of, of, of breast cancer recurring by eating a low-fat diet of 30 grams or less, uh, power walking, as this gal was doing, for 30 minutes five times a week. Those are things that you can do for yourself that will help to reduce your risk. But I want to give you an analogy um, because uh, I find that this is a, a, a good one and I think that you'll probably be able to re relate to it. So the weatherman says that there's a 20% possibility that, that uh, there could be a snowstorm next Monday. So six days from now, <clears throat> that could bring us four inches of snow. Do you immediately start worrying and fretting and feeling paralyzed? You will miss a day from work or without PTO, your paycheck will be short. Uh, do you start losing sleep, picturing the snow coming down? 
Do you start stockpiling toilet paper, as many people do, um, as if you think that we're now going to be snowbound for weeks? And I hope that you're not doing that, but many people do. <clears throat> you become frantic picturing having to drive in the snow to work or really anywhere, even having to go one block in your car if this snowstorm does in fact come. However, do you make sure that your snow shovel is located in the garage? Do you have a window scraper for your car windows? Do you have a de-icer for the lock on your car door if you're not parked in a garage? If you have a snow blower, do you make sure that it's in working order? Do you watch the news on Saturday and Sunday to get the latest update on the storm rather than watching it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday <clears throat> on every channel that it's on at every hour that it's on? to see what the weatherman has to say. You can plan to use Uber or Lyft because of concern about driving yourself to work uh, on Monday, which is a reasonable option. Have a special fund in a mason jar set aside for your Uber rides in the snow. And when you watch the news over the weekend, you learn that the storm has gone around you, geogra your geographic area, and there will in fact be no snow on Monday. Ah. The first person in this scenario lost sleep, waited in line for an hour to get toilet paper and maybe even milk, even if she doesn't like to drink milk, and bread. She fretted every day, much of the day, constantly waiting uh, for weather reports on her TV or on her phone. She got indigestion from worrying. Um, she has continuous anxiety from worrying. She canceled her Monday night uh, get together with her girlfriends uh, that she does after work on Mondays from worrying, and it was all for nothing. So for her, snow and fear of recurrence are the same enemy. They both paralyze her, monopolize her ability to function well in her day-to-day -day activities and prevent her from having any joy in her life as she waits for the dreaded snowstorm to come. I will now tell you that for four decades, I had a fear of the snow. It was triggered by being in a bad car accident while driving home from night school <clears throat> after work at around 10 p.m. There was about three inches of snow on the ground along with ice. I was broadsided uh, by a car and it broke my wrist and my knee and I had a head injury. I sat in that car unable to open my door uh, because it was slammed in and I really wasn't able to move at all for 45 minutes and I watched cars drive around me. Finally, a snowplow driver stopped to help me and I was taken to the hospital a short while later. Prior to the accident, I never worried about snow. After the accident, I was petrified of snow. I had to learn new coping skills, new emergency planning, new ways to cope with this kind of fear, and I have even learned how to enjoy watching snowflakes fall, <clears throat> looking at them through my living room window, and I bought a book about snowflakes too. I wanted to learn about snowflakes. Every January, I have a snowflake spa party here at my house for my girlfriends. So I embrace snow and specifically snowflakes. I also got a four wheel drive SUV as my next vehicle. And that's the, uh, I always replace my old ones with a new SUV. And if, a, if there is a blizzard, I have the option to stay home. I, by the way, already have enough toilet paper in my basement for my emergencies and also for your emergencies. So the key is to give your fear real perspective rather than assuming something terrible is going to happen and you are destined to get recurrence of your breast cancer. Know what your actual risk really is and take measures to learn coping skills like meditation, yoga, singing, listening to, to soothing music, journaling, and always, always, always find joy in each day. We are among the lucky who got to live. We need to demonstrate we value each day because there are many others who lost their opportunity to be able to do that. So I want to tell you a little story about a woman named Miss Bertha, who was the very first woman I ever knew who had breast cancer. I was 12 when she was diagnosed. She was my other mother and my mother's best friend. And... Uh, she was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer from the onset. This was 55 years ago when we didn't have information in women's magazines about breast cancer, no billboards promoting mammography. 
she had all of the warning signs that she had a big fungating mass in her breast. She had pain in her ribs, pain in her back, a swelled abdomen, and finally went to the doctor because she thought that her ribs hurt because she had arthritis. Of course, it wasn't arthritis. He explained to her that she had very advanced cancer. And uh, back then, we did a total radical mastectomy, which, thank you, God, we don't do anymore. Removal of the breast, both chest muscles. She also had three ribs removed. All of the lymph nodes under her, under her arm, all the way down to her elbow. And these ribs, excuse me, these lymph nodes went inwardly down to her lung. Um, he told her he would follow it with chemotherapy. We only had one drug to offer them. And that he would give her cobalt radiation, which meant that we stand you up against a wall and we beam the radiation at you with no way to target it. So really your whole body gets radiated, including your brain. Um, they targeted her breast area and she had portal holes in her back that were permanent where the radiation had exited. So no way to target radiation back then. But the doctor said the fact of the matter is I don't think you're going to live more than five months, so the best thing you can do for yourself is to go home and get your affairs in order. And she was a psychologist, and she said, well, <clears throat> I, uh, I am going to get my affairs in order, uh, but I, I made a list of personal goals I intend to achieve before I leave this world. And uh, though I think you're a really good doctor, you're kind of rude. So I made a decision I'm going to add a goal to that, and my goal, mister, is to outlive you her doctor, and Miss Bertha was a miracle patient. She lived for 21 more years. Only the last year of her life was not good quality. The rest was fantastic. On a particular day, she and I were to go beach combing on the Chesapeake Bay. We planned it three weeks ahead. And on that day, it was raining. There was, it, was, it wasn't a thunderstorm, but it was raining. And uh, so my mother said, well, I'm still gonna take you over to be with her. Uh, however, I don't think that you're gonna be going out um, to walk on the beach. She'll probably play some board games and Miss Bertha plays the piano and you love singing with her. So that's probably how you spend your day. So when I got over there, Miss Bertha came out of her house wearing a yellow slicker, carrying a yellow slicker in her arms, having a yellow hat, carrying another yellow hat and two umbrellas. And I opened the car door and I said, Miss Bertha, it's raining. And she said, yes, isn't it beautiful? And we walked down to the beach. And as we walked along the beach, she said, look how the rain is making little tiny holes in the sand. Look how the rain is hitting the waves as the waves come in and come close to our feet. She says, now take off your hat, put your uh, umbrella down, tip your head back and feel the rain on your face. Open your mouth and feel the rain on your tongue. Isn't the rain beautiful? And what she taught me is that every moment of our life we can find joy in it. We just have to choose to look. So I've always remembered that. And whenever there's a light rain outside, I, I think about Miss Bertha and the lessons that she taught me. So <clears throat> I am hoping that, uh, that uh, all of you have been, uh, as I say, uh, following the lifestyle uh, behaviors that do help to reduce your risk, but I realize that that might not be the case. Um, so if you haven't been, this is a great time to adopt some of those lifestyle behaviors. And one of them also is reducing your stress level. Uh, high stress produces cortisol in our body and it prevents our T cells, T as in Tom, our T cells from working. Our body produces T cells every day T cells are the cells that fight cancer, which I think is very interesting. So our body is actually doing its own cancer prevention every single day for us. We just don't know about it. So in order to keep your T cells pumping and doing their job, you need to have a good immune system intact. And that usually means to reduce your stress level because we know that stress does tax our immune system. That's why, like after a big holiday, like Christmas and New Year's, we're exhausted because we've had to do so much between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And you might say, oh, look at it, it's January 4th and now I have a winter cold, dag nabbit. That's not surprising to me. It is because your immune system dropped while you were trying to do way too many things at once. So <clears throat> I want you to think about ways in which you can reduce your stress, increase your ability to live a, a healthier lifestyle and put 
breast cancer recurrence in its place and not be dwelling on it every day or even every week or every month because it doesn't deserve it. You've given breast cancer what it needed to get rid of it. Don't allow it to take away any more of you. Uh, don't give it that kind of power. You need to be the one in charge. I'm now going to open it up for, for questions for about 10 minutes. So I'll rely on the folks on on your end to uh, to help make that happen. <laughs> so Lily, it's Eileen. I'm going to jump in here. And, uh, and so what I'm going to do is I've got a couple of questions uh, that I'm okay. going to read to you. I think that's the way we'll okay. handle it. And I want to yes. also uh, invite the audience, if you do have some additional questions, we've got some time here and, uh, and, and hope to address everything that we can. Mm -hmm. So the first one, uh, should we ever stop being on watch for the next time? Mm -hmm. There were 12 years between my last two bouts and now 15 more years have passed. And so, so that's the end of the question. Do you want to address yeah. that? Sure. So the risk of developing breast cancer after you've passed 10 years is 1% to 2%. So think about that with snow. There's a 1% to 2% risk of some snow flurries. There's a 98% risk there'll be no snow. So there's a 98% probability you will not revisit this again. If, however, your recurrences were regionally in your lymph nodes, or if you're describing to me that you have um, breast cancer that has, uh, that is actually stage four disease and has been in remission, if that's, if that's what you're describing to me, and that might be what you're describing to me, then uh, when it is stage four, it can kind of, kind of show up whenever it feels like it. Uh, and you should be on medication for that pretty much all of the time. Some type of maintenance drug if you have had uh, stage four in the past. <clears throat> uh, so thank I, you. I'm no, hoping that. Sure. Thank you. And so uh, Karen I can uh, can weigh in on that, but I think that, that that's good. Uh, I'm going to read another question, and I'm going to start with the second part of it. Uh, first, which is a general comment. And so uh, this person is saying, I've never really had a fear. I even uh, forgot that I had, to me, I'm reading this wrong. I even forgot yeah. I had cancer, except for doing the right things to stay healthy. Uh, uh. And then she had a third diagnosis, uh, was found as a fluke. And so now I'm going to go back to the question because I think it sets a, uh, a tone here. And, and she's really asking about any alcohol. You know, is any alcohol okay? Uh, her third breast so, cancer was in her chest, wall, and lung. Okay. So we are talking about stage four breast cancer. And for women with stage four breast cancer, we have to balance risk factors. Um, uh, is alcohol a risk factor? Yes, it is. It used to be that we would say you could have one alcoholic beverage a day and it does not increase your risk. Uh, that changed a year and a half ago. And so research studies showed that uh, any alcohol could increase your risk. Ironically, alcohol increases the estrogen in your body. I don't think we figured out how it does that, but it does. Um, so I always say, sometimes it doesn't matter how it does it. If it does it, we need to be aware of it. Mm -hmm. However, if you really do enjoy a glass of wine, let's say twice a week with dinner, then I feel relatively, I feel 99.9% .9 positive that your medical oncologist is going to say to you, go ahead and have that glass of wine, but have it be one glass, not more than that. Have it be a normal size wine glass and not a big, you know, giant wine glass, uh, because we are balancing joy with risk of recurrence. Uh, I think it's fabulous that you've had so many years go by, though, uh, with be and being in remission. That's that's wonderful, marvelous, incredible, and uh, and uh, I'll hope and pray that you remain in remission. Would be exactly what we hope happens. Um, uh, so tell me the next question. Sure. And so um, is there a blood test to assess risk of reoccurrence or actual occurrence? Yeah. So there is a blood test 
that's in clinical studies that's being done, not just for breast, but also for prostate, uh, for solid organ tumors, I guess I should say. Um, so also for lung, also for pancreatic. Pancreatic's a really key one for people that carry a BRCA2 gene mutation. Uh, they're at risk of breast, ovarian, pancreatic, colorectal, and early age prostate for men. Um, uh, this uh, blood test uh, was developed at, I'm pretty sure I'm right in telling you, Cleveland Clinic. Uh, it was just publicized about eight or nine days ago. So you might want to Google a blood test for uh, measuring cancer risk and uh, a URL for it should pop up with an article that describes what the findings have been and how it will get rolled out across the country. These kinds of things get rolled out slowly um, because we know that it was done at it, the, the research was done at one facility and not at many facilities. So that next step is going to be for other facilities that are large academic cancer centers to now do, frankly, hundreds of thousands of patients for the same purpose of, of uh, determining its accuracy. They did find it to be 96% accurate, which is very accurate. Uh, and this was a long-term study. So if you can imagine being a patient that have this kind of a blood test done, and then they would have to wait to see, this says I'm at high risk and I got to sit back and wait. Um, uh, and that's what they had to do to see uh, whether or not uh, they were going to develop this particular type of cancer. There is also is a blood test that uh, measures circulating tumor cells a CTC test, and it's a blood test, and the pathologist actually looks to see, do I see any breast cancer cells in your blood rolling around? Because the way in which uh, breast cancer and other solid organ tumors travel is through the bloodstream or through our lymphatic system. And let me also mention that when we're evaluating our own risk, when you have the bi breast biopsy done, as well as your breast cancer surgery done, the pathologist looked at that specimen under the microscope first to find out, yes, it was breast cancer and what kind of breast cancer it was, what its prognostic factors were for ER, PEER, and HER2, what its grade was, grade one, two, or three, what its KI67 was, how quickly is it multiplying and subdividing. But it also, that doctor also looked to see do I see any lymphatics, which means lymph node vessels running through the tumor? Do I see any blood vessels, vascular? Do I see that running through the tumor? And they will make note of it in saying, no, I don't see any, or yes, I do. So if you're not sure, go back and look at your biopsy report and also at your breast cancer surgery pathology report, whether that be for lumbectomy or mastectomy, and see what it said. If it said there was no evidence of vascular or lymphatic invasion, then hallelujah. The probability of this cancer being able to travel anywhere goes way, 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 way down because it didn't have the right pathways already developed in the breast tumor itself to get to travel. So that, that really does knock it way down, usually to 1% ability to move around in, in your body. Okay, that, that was a terrific answer. So I, I wanna uh, change uh, just a little bit here. So the next question, my white blood cell count is still very low after chemotherapy. How do I get my white blood cell count up? Yeah, so uh, some women have a low white blood count for two to three years. That just happens to 5% of people, but if you're in the 5%, it's 100% for you. Um, one of the ways, ironically, this is gonna sound crazy, but it has been proven uh, through uh, research. Uh, some of that research was actually done at Johns Hopkins. <clears throat> Getting out and brisk walking, power walking, and going up and down steps 
so that you're really getting your, your blood pumping does increase your white blood count. It also bumps up your red blood count if you're a little bit anemic. Um, we don't understand exactly why, <laughs> but it's one of those things which, which now we don't care as long as it works. Uh, so that's something that I would, would certainly recommend. And because your white blood count is lower than ideal, you need to be extra cautious about staying away from people that have colds and flu and, you know, God forbid, God forbid might have COVID-19. Um, and I do want to stress to all of you, if you haven't been vaccinated, please do talk with your medical oncologist or your PCP um, because you should be vaccinated. If you're in active treatment, there's specific windows of time when it is safe to receive the vaccines uh, that it won't affect uh, your your blood counts. Um, and uh, you also should be getting that third shot, which is a, a booster. And yes, I have gotten all three of those and happily got all of them. And if And if somebody tells me I need to get a booster every month, I'm probably going to be first in line before the sun rises to go in and do that. Uh, we know how highly effective these are. Um, I'll let you in on a secret, which uh, I've only told my husband and my daughter, ironically, but I'll, I'll, I'll share this with, with all of you folks today. And that is that people have been frightened of the mRNA, which is the Pfizer and the Moderna uh, vaccines. Now, here's the funny, because people have said, how could they have developed a vaccine so quickly for this? This doesn't make any sense to me. <clears throat> it was developed quickly because of all the research that's been done with cancer vaccines. <clears throat> <clears throat> we took that, that cancer vaccine research, which is based on mRNA. And we also know that the only way we can get cancer is to have inflammation in our body. So prior viruses that we've had in our youth, uh, in life, whenever we've had it, or other forms of inflammation. So, for example, somebody has hepatitis C. If it isn't effectively treated very early on, which now there are drugs for it, and there's a vaccine for it, isn't there, to prevent getting hepatitis B and hepatitis C. If that is not treated, those are the people who develop a liver sarcoma 99% of the time, about 10 to 15 years after they've had hepatitis. And it's because of that inflammation of the liver caused by the virus, hepatitis, that then allowed cancer cells to grow in that liver and give them a liver sarcoma. So that's how these vaccines, those two, develop so daggone quickly is because we said, wait a minute, this is a virus. We know a lot about viruses. We don't know much about this one, but look at all the virus research we've done that has driven us to now understand how to develop cancer vaccines. So they went back to all of that history and said, ah, we're three-fourths of the way here. We're going to get here in just a few months. And so they did. Um, but they aren't telling people on television, and I don't know why that is, because it would certainly solve the, I don't know how they made this so quick, I don't trust it because it happened too quickly. It didn't happen that quickly. This is based on over 35 years of research. <laughs> so uh, we just had good timing is what it amounts to, that it was the right timing to say, ah, let's take what we already know and finish it. And um, so... So please do get your get your COVID-19 uh, vaccines and, and stay away from people that aren't getting them or are not candidates for getting them. Um, if you're going to be around family for Thanksgiving, and I hope that you are, uh, anyone unvaccinated, which includes, you know, toddlers, it's a good idea to get a uh, COVID uh, test kit. Um, if they're out of them at the uh, box chain pharmacies like CVS and Rite Aid, Walgreens and such, Amazon does have a good supply. I actually keep four on hand uh, in case somebody comes to visit me as a surprise, which I've had happen. And uh, this predated the vaccine being available. So she was in my area, wasn't going to be again, maybe ever. And um, she was from the West Coast and was here visiting some other people. 
and uh, just came and surprised me, which was a wonderful surprise. But I said, you can't come in my door until I do a test on you. <laughs> so uh, so people can't cross my threshold unless I know they're COVID-19 free. <clears throat> and um, uh, well, you have I, and I do. Oh, go on. Oh, go, go right ahead. You have some other questions. I didn't want us oh, to run. Sorry, go right ahead. Yeah, if sorry. We can, can do yeah. that. Okay, so yeah. let me uh, start here. So, does the Oncotype DX genetic test apply to women with lymph node involvement? The answer is yes. You can have up to three positive lymph nodes, and Oncotype DX uh, does work. Um, for patients that have invasive lobular carcinoma, which is 14% of invasive breast cancers, invasive ductal, 85% have that kind, invasive lobular, uh, only 14% have that kind. It doesn't always work as well, the Oncotype DX, only because there aren't as many patients that it has been tested on, comparing that 85% to 14%. But yes, up to three positive nodes and it's ER positive, HER2 negative, uh, the Oncotype DX test works, yes. Thank you. Uh, this is a really uh, great question. What type of surveillance should breast cancer patients insist on? At first, my doctor said just the CA125 and CA tests. I pressed for more having had breast cancer once before and now have had more scans and a surveillance schedule that I'm satisfied with. But the question is about surveillance. So for those that do have not had stage four breast cancer, so it is not metastasized and traveled on to another organ like the lung, the liver, the bone. <clears throat> uh, doing scans today is a no-no. Used to be we did scans every six months on everybody. And uh, standard of care changed, uh, hold on to your hat for this, 18 years ago, a long time ago. It was found that doing these scans did not help anybody. We will always find something on a scan. Uh, that's how I ended up having the scan I told you about mine, where they said, oh, we see something this time and it's in your lung. Looks like it's probably metastatic lung cancer. We need to do a biopsy. And lo and behold, it wasn't lung cancer. It was a grain of rice that I had aspirated on two weeks prior to that. Uh, so we, we will find, we can always find some dixel pixel on a Dagon scan. Uh, unfortunately, and then we chase that down, right? Because we go, well, we got to figure out what this is. The, the the problem is, is that almost always it will be nothing related to cancer, but it became guilty by association. So for those that have stage four disease, <clears throat> we would be scanning based on your treatment that you're receiving and how long does it take for that treatment to start working which is usually three treatments, or every six months to see if we see that the cancer is spread elsewhere, or if you've got a new ache or pain somewhere. For those that are stage zero to three, <clears throat> we do not do scans. We should not be doing scans. We should not be doing blood tests either. <clears throat> These tumor markers that were just described um, like the CA125, uh, uh, the CA2729, um, they are very imperfect. And I'll, I'll give you an example. For the CA125, if you get a flu shot this week and next week you get that blood test done, your number is going to be in the three digits. And somebody's going to say to you, oh, my God, you've got cancer based on the number when it was the flu shot that gave a false positive and drove that number up. There are a zillion reasons why tumor markers can go up, and we don't know all of the reasons yet. Um, but that is why we don't rely on tumor marker blood tests. A doctor usually will do these blood tests once it is found that you have metastatic disease in another organ um, to see how accurate is that blood test for you. And if he finds that it's pretty accurate, uh, he might use it as a barometer for the future, but he won't hang his hat on it, uh, believe me. 
uh, and it's not a good idea to hang, hang your hat on those blood tests. They are very imperfect. Look at PSAs for men um, to determine if they've got prostate cancer or not. Um, <clears throat> once a man's over the age of 65, his PSA is going to be elevated. And it's because he's got prostatitis, which 100% of men will get over the age of 65. So why are we doing that blood test? Today, we're not. If you're over the age of 65, we're not doing that blood test anymore. <clears throat> and I have time for one more question, and then I need to leave you to then jump on a different phone. <laughs> for okay, different so th there are several more questions. And so here, I'm okay. going to jump in with this one. Uh, this comes from a, a person. Uh, I understand John Hopkins has been involved in a mistletoe clinical trial. Yeah. Any information you can share and its significance for treatment? Yes. So <clears throat> what we've learned so far is that it didn't hold the promise that we thought it would. Um, so we're not recommending it. Um, the study was done over a six-year period. Um, anecdotally, for some patients, it might have worked, but anything will work anecdotally, you know, the one in 100,000. Um, so I would not encourage people to go out and get mistletoe injections. And there are people that will advertise that on the internet, come to me and I will cure you of your metastatic disease by injecting your abdomen with mistletoe juice. Don't do it, please. Okay, and so thank you for um, for that information. Okay. Sure. sure. All right. So uh, what I will say is there's a, a couple. Um, a go on, if, Lily. If 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 there are other questions, how about if you give them my email address? Okay. And, and I will so answer them that way for them, if that's okay. Hopefully, with everybody. Thank you very much. And so I I sure. will. Get that uh, I will actually uh, actually I, I don't have your email address. Can you just say it out oh, loud? Sure, let me tell you. I absolutely can. S H O C K L I at J H M I dot E D U. So it's shock from Shockney, it's L I from Lily, the at symbol. JHMI, which stands for Johns Hopkins Medical Institution, dot edu. Okay, Lily, then we're going to let you go. Thank you very much All for right. pursuing the You're very welcome, and thank you for, being for putting up for my failed technology here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> okay, have a good day. Thank, thank you. you. All right, bye-bye. Thank you so okay. much. Okay, and so it, uh, it's me again, and I want to say thank you for everyone for uh, persevering through the technical issues that we had with Lily, but I think uh, you would all hopefully agree with me that it was uh, well worth uh, having this time with Lily, that she actually had, uh, I think, some really great insight into, uh, into balancing some of our concerns uh, about reoccurrence and understanding how we can factor in the science. And I think I, I speak for everyone who's on this, uh, this program today, that we all are, are wanting to learn and gain as much information as we potentially can so that we, uh, so that we, we live the most joyful lives that we can. And, uh, and you know, I want to say all the more power for people who are on from the, uh, from the medical community and uh, all the good work that is done to keep us all as healthy as we can be. And so with that, I would like to introduce um, and, and invite Rita Cox to say a few words. Rita is the, uh, the board president of Two Life, and she is with us this morning. Her schedule doesn't always allow her to do programs during the course of the day. So Rita, if you are close by and want to chime in and say hello, welcome. Welcome. And I got to, I have to tell you, Eileen, I am so excited that today was the day that I got to actually join in on one of these. I was excited about listening to Lily because I, I completely understand where everybody is. Um, I'm a 10 year survivor and yesterday was one of my follow-up visits and um, I still get that pit in the bottom of my stomach waiting, waiting for results. So I completely understand. And, and when people talk about, you know, the odds of recurrence, um, I don't always 
believe that because we've all heard, um, a lot of us have heard multiple times that your situation is rare and the odds of it coming back again are, are small. Um, so it's often hard to put those those odds in, in perspective. And there were a lot of things today that, that Lily said that really helped me put them in perspective. Um, in particular, the, the snow analogy. Um, Cause yeah, I don't, I don't run to the grocery store when there's a 10% chance of a blizzard. So um, I'm gonna remember that and that will definitely make these, these easier for me. I think uh, there was a lot of great information today. I hope everyone was able to find a couple of nuggets, um, at least a couple that will help in their situation and help them feel better moving forward. And, um, and I'm very thankful to Lily for taking the time today and providing her email address so that if anybody has additional questions, they can follow up. So thank you so much to everybody this morning. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Eileen and Chris and Sue and Jamila and everyone else on the team at Two Life for making today happen. I hope everyone has a great day.